Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman, here with another episode of Caesar. Uh, this one just dropped today, actually, and you guys are great because I would not have known it dropped today. But you guys in the comments were awesome, like usual, and uh, let me know. So here we are with the, the next installment of Caesar. Uh, he's on his way to Africa, apparently, and. Uh, uh, yeah, last episode we had a pretty cool, couple of pretty cool battles. You know, one Caesar wasn't involved. You know, it was pretty, pretty, just a really cool battle. And the second one, Caesar was involved. I mean, he was in disbelief how easy that battle was. So definitely check out that video, the previous one, if you haven't yet. And if you're your first time here, definitely check out the beginning of the series. I got it on a playlist. And uh, if you want to leave a suggestion for a future series, uh, Go to my uh, community page and just, you know, post uh, something you'd like to see. And then maybe, maybe you'll get thrown into a poll. Uh, you're, only, you're only allowed uh, five options on poll. So, obviously, I'm not going to get, like, everyone's kind of choice in that poll. I mean, like I said, it'll probably be a few days before I do that. You know, because I'm gonna probably going to do, you know, a couple, like, you know, one-shot, you know, episodes. And maybe a couple of maybe two-part series. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing yet. She'll hold me to anything. So, uh, but anyway, uh, Caesar in Africa, Battle of Respania, 46 BC. I probably butchered that, but uh, let's get to it. Before I do, please hit that like and subscribe button if you haven't yet. Please and thank you. And uh, yes, definitely check out some of the other playlists if you're new here too. I uh, think I've got everything covered. Let's get to it. You guys are having a fantastic day. Woo! Still winding down from work. Just did the Indonesia video on the Geography Now series, and now we're headed to some uh, things in general. Amazing, amazing YouTube channel. Three, two, one, bam. <laughs> Since the beginning of the Great Roman Civil War, Caesar had won battles in Iberia, Greece, Anatolia and Egypt, scoring victories in all three parts of the Old World. But yep. the final triumph was nowhere in sight. Not everything... Well, I guess it's not in sight, but... I mean, he's doing pretty good for himself. I mean, he's got to take out the last, like, guys from... His... Ah, uh, what's his name? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm in a blank, but they're all in Africa, most of them anyway, so he kind of has to squash that, you know, uprising, that army that's getting built over there, and then he should be pretty good, right, because a lot of his other generals kind of helped him out over in Spain and stuff, I believe they said last episode, so we'll find out, right? Thing was well in Rome, his own legions were agitated, and his enemies were gathering forces in North Africa. This video... Yeah, yeah, enemies were gathering forces in North Africa, and I think Mark Antony is still in Rome, and he's not really doing a great job. I guess he's not that much of a politician, so... Whatever. <laughs> Let's get on with this and uh, see what we have in store for us today. ...and his enemies were gathering forces in North Africa. This video will cover Caesar's attempts to fix internal issues, the beginning of his campaign in North Africa, and the Battle of Ruspina. It is our honor to announce that this episode is sponsored by Total War Rome Remastered and Creative Assembly. Rome Total War is deservedly one of the most loved entries in the franchise, so the fact it's being remade is a dream of strategy games ever by clicking the link in the description. I just want to say that again just looks really cool. One day I'll end up playing it, I'm sure, because that again just looks really cool. Even though I just skipped the uh, commercial for it. <laughs> It is now late in 47 BC, almost a year and a half since the Battle of Pharsalus. Caesar had fought Pharsalus, intending it to be a final killing blow to the Pompeian cause, and while it had been successful in severely handicapping the Pompeians, it had failed to destroy them completely. While Caesar had spent the last 18 months campaigning in the east, the Pompeian faction had been rebuilding in North Africa. Leadership had initially been offered to Cicero, but he had refused, 
preferring to use his political talents to try and influence the Senate in Rome. Instead, leadership was split between Cato and Scipio. Cato was something of a natural successor. He had consistently been one of Caesar's most ardent opponents and wielded great influence and prestige in the party, but he had next to no military experience. To balance this, Metellus Scipio was appointed as the overall military commander. Scipio had a long political career and served as consul alongside Pompey in 52 BC, had commanded an army in Greece against Domitius Calvinus and had commanded the centre at Pharsalus. Despite these honours, Scipio had not really proved himself as a talented general. A number of his subordinates, most notably Labienus, were undoubtedly better commanders. Nevertheless, Scipio was given command due to his rank, prestige, and perhaps most of all, his name. Wow, that's already like asking for trouble. Yes, Caesar, who's been through like a billion battles, come out on top, and uh, and Caesar has been against, you know, obviously better men, better commanders than like Scipio. You know, so it's not like oh my god. I'm, I'm going against Scipio. Oh my God, no! It's like uh, he knows Scipio. He knows just from you know Rome and everything, and he knows Scipio uh, doesn't really he's not really an expert at what he's doing. So he easily like use that against him to kind of you know get him into a battle he's not, he's not sure he wants or something. So these are big advantage just based on leadership right now, man. In command due to his rank, prestige, and perhaps most of all, his name. Thanks to Scipio Africanus and Scipio Aemilianus, it was rumored that no Scipio could be defeated in Africa. Wow, we'll see. A new senate had been created in Utica, and a total of 14 legions mustered, two belonging to the governor of Africa, Publius Attius Varus, eight newly formed consisting of local conscripts, as well as veterans who escaped from Iberia and Greece after the defeats at Munda and Pharsalus, and four of Juba's Numidian legions who were armed and trained in the Roman fashion, plus a huge amount of Numidian light infantry and cavalry, and 120 elephants. Wow. Pompey's son, Gnaeus, had been sent to Spain to try and capitalize on the pro-Pompeian mutiny that had occurred during Longinus's tenure as governor, and there was a rumor that the Pompeian faction was planning an invasion of Italy itself. Caesar was aware of the threat, and had initially planned an invasion from both the west and east. Longinus would land his Spanish legions and attack from the west, while Caesar would invade from Italy. Longinus's abysmal administration of his province had scuppered this plan, however. Caesar would need to invade himself and without the reinforcements from Spain. Caesar's African war was about to begin. Yeah. As Caesar returned to Italy from Asia Minor, he visited various client kings and rulers from in and around Greece, collecting money. Caesar had been recruiting massively throughout the civil war, spending almost all his personal money in the process, and the financial situation was dire. Even with the money collected from these rulers, he still needed more. Upon his arrival in Italy, he borrowed huge sums from individuals and cities alike. Caesar likely had no intention of repaying these huge debts, but in his opinion, the money was being spent on the public good and so was no different from an official tax or levy. The money was given, but it cost Caesar popularity. Caesar was well aware of this fact, however, and worked hard to keep the people on side. Clearly, Caesar was well aware that to win any war, it is vital that the population at large is kept on side. Right. There was one other major issue that Caesar needed to resolve before he could begin the invasion of Africa. Four of his veteran legions left in Campania and picked to be part of the African campaign had mutinied a couple of months before Caesar's arrival in Italy. 
These legions had been campaigning continuously for 13 years and had been wow. promised payment and discharge following the Battle of Pharsalus. Caesar's campaigns in Egypt and the East. I don't blame anybody. 13 years? Think about that. If you have a family, you see kids that are like five, they're full, full grown men now, man. So, and then you need money. Oh my God. You need money because kind of like, Keep your family going while you're out and out and about, you know, fighting, uh, and you're not getting that. I, I can't really blame an uprising. I mean, obvious, you know, you're loyal to your leader, but you know, if you're not kind of getting that loyalty back or getting, you know, getting something that's coming back from your leader, you know, I guess it's expected to kind of, you know, revolt. So, uh, I'm curious to see what he does here to kind of like, you know, calm his troops down, you know, so and just be. We'll find out. Judge following the Battle of Pharsalus. Caesar's campaigns in Egypt and the East had delayed this, and with their general gone for almost a year, Antony had lost control, the legions going so far as to loot wealthy estates around Rome, and even killing two senators who had tried to negotiate with them. Four veteran legions presented... I mean, Mark Antony, obviously... He didn't really do that great. I mean, he didn't, uh, the people and obviously our Anthony's not like a good, I don't know, I guess, I want to say a leader, but as far as, I don't know, doing all the, the things that need to be done to kind of like run a city, he's not, you know, I guess he's not built for that, but, um, he could have, at least he didn't turn against Caesar. I mean, He's been by himself for so long over there. I'm sure he's had a bunch of offers to kind of uh, turn his back on Caesar, but he never took them. So at least he's loyal. I mean, he might not be the best, but at least he's loyal, right? Senators who had tried to negotiate with them. Four veteran legions presented a very serious threat if they could not be placated. Caesar recognized this danger and even garrisoned Rome. He was advised not to risk negotiating in person, but Caesar knew that these men were some of his best soldiers and would be much needed in the campaigns to come. He met them alone at the Campus Martius. In reality, the legions were attempting to bluff Caesar, hoping that Caesar would not allow them to be discharged and they would then push for more pay. Caesar called their bluff and disbanded them on the spot calling them citizens rather than soldiers, he promised they would all be paid in full and with interest after his conquest of Africa and subsequent triumph with other legions. Caesar continued, allotting the men land from public holdings as well as from his own. Caesar concluded by saying, I really have no further need of you, yet even so I will pay you the rewards that no one may say that after using you in danger, I later showed myself ungrateful even though you were unwilling to join my campaign while perfectly strong in body and able to carry through all the wars that remain. The legionaries were stunned. They considered themselves indispensable to Caesar and were shamed by how readily Caesar would use other legions to finish the war they had helped start, as well as by how generously and quickly he would reward them. For these men, Caesar was everything. They had become wealthy and famous under his leadership. Now they had attempted to blackmail him, had their bluff called, and were being put out to pasture. Wow. The legions then asked whether they could volunteer to join Caesar in Africa, but Caesar simply turned his back and began to walk away. Desperately, the men begged him to stay and re-enlist them. Caesar feigned indifference before agreeing to reinstate all but the 10th legion. This legion was his favorite, and he made it clear that he was insulted that they in particular had joined the mutiny. Stung by his words, the 10th requested that Caesar decimate the legion, killing one in every 10 men as punishment so that they might be taken back into his favor. Wow. Again, Caesar feigned indifference before relenting and accepting the legion back without punishment. Caesar did keep a list that is crazy. Wow, called their bluff. 
This sort of reminds me of it, it's kind of it's kind of similar. Alexander the Great, the speech he had. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys. I know some of you have, but like. I did a, I actually did a video on uh, Alexander the Great's speech, and it there's a lot of similarities here, you know, to where you know he's like, yeah, sure, go home, you know, and then the the the, the men were like, oh my god, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's basically it's very similar here, you know. So it's kind of cool how you know have two great leaders and two of the similar things happen to both, and they both kind of use the same tactics. So that 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 was really cool. punishment. Caesar did keep a list of the leading figures of the mutiny and assigned them to other legions in particularly dangerous provinces, but overall it had been a brilliant success. All four legions were brought back into the fold without a sesterce being spent or a drop of blood shed. It was a prime example of the importance of the persona and personality of Caesar. No other man at the time could have spoken to the legions and reached such a conclusion. Wow. With the legions once again under control, Caesar could finally begin his invasion, and he ordered ten legions to gather in Lilibaeum, Sicily, around late December. Word had reached Caesar of the rumour that no Scipio could be defeated in Africa, and to counter these, he quickly found a minor member of the Scipio family to include in his officer's staff. He too now had a Scipio in his army. Nice. The veteran legions in Campania were still being organized for the campaign. But that, that's so funny because obviously that superstition, no Scipio can be in Africa. So he, and he probably knows this, but just to kind of like help his men and just for the, uh, the opposing side, knowing that there's a Scipio on his side, you know, and de definitely how it's, it's just kind of cool, you know, how the pull the politics and beliefs, you know, uh, each side just trying to outplay each other for, uh, I don't know, for morale reasons and stuff like, I don't know. It's just funny. Six legions were ready in Lilibaeum. Five were relatively recently raised and untested. One was Caesar's veteran fifth legion and some cohorts of the 10th, which had been stationed in Brundisium. Caesar was eager to sail as soon as possible, but the mutiny had delayed his plans, and he was now faced with bad weather. Uh. Never one for waiting, he embarked his men and ordered them to Africa at the first sign of a lull in the storms. Caesar spent two days in Sicily, giving instructions for the rest of the army when they arrived on the island, before setting sail himself on the 25th of December. Cool. He reached the African coast on the 28th of December, landing near Hadrametum. In his eagerness to attack quickly, Caesar had risked the storms, and though most of his warships had managed to cross safely, many of his transports had been scattered, leaving him with just 3,000 infantry and 150 cavalry. Wow. Hadrametum itself was under optimate control, garrisoned by 10,000 Romans and Numidians under the command of Gaius Considius Longus and Gnaeus Calpurnius Piso. Wow. Caesar encamped just outside of the city on the coast. His men's morale was low due to the uncoordinated crossing, and they were blaming Caesar because, in his haste, he had not issued clear, written and sealed orders to his lieutenants as he usually did. They were right. Hmm. Caesar's obsession with being quick had, this time, backfired. Caesar was in a dangerous position. If the Optimates sallied out of Hadrametum, or if enemy reinforcements arrived, his small force could be caught against the coast. Initially, Caesar attempted to negotiate with Considius, but the messenger was killed, and the message sent unread to Scipio. Wow. He had now spent a day and a night around Hadrametum, and no more of his army had arrived. Caesar made some minor probing attacks on the city, but quickly decided he had neither the numbers nor amount of veterans needed to storm the city. To make matters worse, his scouts also reported that a large force of Numidian cavalry was closing in. With little choice left, Caesar broke camp and marched away from the city. As soon as he did, though, the Hadrametum garrison sallied out, 
soon being joined by Juba's cavalry, which had just arrived. Uh, uh -oh. They seized the deserted camp, and the Numidian cavalry began harassing Caesar's men, forcing Caesar to halt and form a defensive line. Clearly, this had been the optimate plan from the start, rather than attack Caesar in a fortified camp, where he was known to be particularly dangerous, they had waited for a chance to catch him in the open. Initially, it looked as though Caesar would be surrounded and caught, just as Curio had been years earlier. Unlike Curio, however, Caesar refused to allow his enemy to hold the initiative, ordering his small numbers of cavalry to charge the Numidians. Caesar was well aware that they did not have the numbers to win such a fight, but he was also aware that the Numidians would retreat and skirmish rather than engage in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. It was vital that Caesar keep his men moving rather than stop and risk becoming surrounded, and with his cavalry having repulsed the Numidians for the time being, Smart. Caesar seized the opportunity ordering his legions to continue their march with the few veteran cohorts and cavalry at the rear. His veterans could be counted on to stand their ground against the incoming missile fire, while the cavalry would charge and scatter the Numidians. Though progress was slow, Caesar was able to continue this fighting withdrawal until he reached the safety of the town of Respina on the 29th of December. Disaster. Good job, Caesar, man. Like, wow. Like, there's no uh, no shame in retreating if you know that you're outnumbered. And, you know, so you don't have to, like, we've seen in other, like, videos, not not just saying, like, Caesar videos, but just other videos where, you know, something like maybe, like, the 30 Years of War or something we've watched where people are like, oh, well, just go in and attack. Like, they're honor, you know, we can't retreat, you know, so... Caesar knows when, you know, when he has the odds in his favor. He knows when they're not in his favor, and so he acts accordingly. And uh, he did not have the advantage here. He could not afford to fight him head on, and he did what he had to do, and it worked. So, really cool stuff right there. Let the odds forever be in your favor. The safety of the town of Respina on the 29th of December. Disaster had been averted but Caesar was still in a precarious position. He next moved on to the town of Leptis on January 1st, where he was joined by some of his scattered transports. As well as his men being scattered, so too had his supplies. He attempted to forage off the land, but patrolling Numidian cavalry would ambush his men, making the task almost impossible. He sent requests to Sardinia, Sicily and other provinces for more grain, and focused on consolidating his position. He left six cohorts in Leptis, one legion in Respina, and took seven cohorts of veterans from the 5th and 10th to the harbour, boarding his warships. He did not inform any of his men what his plan was, but his veterans were confident that Caesar would have a winning strategy. In fact, Caesar's plan was to set sail with the veterans to find the rest of his scattered fleet. Caesar had not told his men this, because he was nervous that the garrisons in Respina or Leptis might be captured and reveal his plans. Clearly, Caesar was rattled and being cautious. Fortunately, the next day, a large number of the lost transports arrived, bringing much-needed numbers. With this nice. larger force, he could now attempt to forage in security. He made camp at Respina, and then on the 4th of January, set out with around 15,000 men, approximately half his total force, to forage for supplies. After marching three miles from Respina, his scouts brought news that the enemy was close and closing in fast. Quickly, Caesar ordered his small contingent of cavalry and archers to join him from Respina, while he rode ahead with his bodyguard to confirm the information. In the distance, he saw a huge dust cloud approaching, and ordered his men to prepare for battle. In total, he would have 15,000 legionaries, 400 cavalry, and 150 archers. The optimate force facing him was significant. 12,000 of mostly light infantry, 8,000 Numidian cavalry, 
and 1,600 heavy cavalry wow. made up of Gallic and Germanic mercenaries, with a smaller force of a further 1,600 Numidian cavalry close by to reinforce. Perhaps the most dangerous aspect of the Optimate army, however, was its commanders. The main force was commanded by Caesar's once right-hand man, Labienus himself, the reinforcements by Petraeus. Labienus was undoubtedly the best general on the Optimate side, and his years of... Dang, man, he's going up against, like, a friggin', uh, I don't know, like, an aw freaking awesome force right now. I'm surprised he's, uh, he's coming out to actually face someone. I'm surprised he's not, like, retreating right now. Maybe he ends up doing that because he's outnumbered in the, basically every way possible, you know, cavalry, cavalry and everything. And he knows they have a great commander. He knows, you know, his tactics probably aren't going to work, you know, as good against him. So, yeah, it seems like his back is against the wall. But then, but then again, we're talking about Caesar here. So, well, let, let, let's see what uh, Caesar has up his sleeve right now. Labienus was undoubtedly the best general on the Optimate side, and his years of campaigning with Caesar had made him familiar with his tactics. Petraeus was also talented and experienced having 30 years of military experience, including having fought Caesar at Ilerda and Pharsalus. This would be a difficult fight. Looking to make the most of his large number of cavalry, Labienus deployed his men in a long, tightly packed line, with infantry interspersed among cavalry in order to hide his numbers. On both flanks, he stationed his heavier cavalry. Caesar, aware that he could be easily outflanked, stretched his line to have as broad a front as possible, putting what missiles he had in front and the small amount of cavalry on the wings. He kept his men in position, not wanting to make the initial move. With his smaller numbers and the enemy's cavalry advantage, he thought it best to be defensive. Yeah. Labienus, on the other hand, used his cavalry to quickly seize the nearby highlands at the same time forcing Caesar's cavalry to stretch thin to try and counter any flanking attacks. Labienus was well aware of Caesar's style of battle, which relied upon having room to maneuver and using terrain advantages, and had now denied these to him. With these initial moves completed, Labienus began the battle. Uh -oh. He ordered his men to charge the length of Caesar's line. Caesar's legions countercharging at the last minute. As they did though, the Numidian cavalry fell back, while the infantry hidden among them pinned Caesar's infantry. The Numidians then skirmished back and forth, pelting Caesar's line with javelins. His men attempted to charge the cavalry to chase them off, but Caesar gave strict orders for his men to hold the line. Meanwhile on the flanks, Caesar's cavalry, badly outnumbered, had been routed after a oh, brief but man. brief struggle. Labienus now had Caesar's force entirely surrounded. At this point, Labienus removed his helmet and rode around the surrounded Caesarians, encouraging his men and mocking Caesar's, attempting to demoralize them. He mocked them as being raw recruits and for being foolhardy for following Caesar and being caught in their current predicament. What? A veteran of the 10th Legion from one of the cohorts who had crossed with Caesar recognized Labienus. Removing his helmet, he threw his javelin, shouting out that Labienus would know he was being attacked by a soldier of the 10th. Labienus's horse was killed, and Labienus was taken from the battlefield after it fell on him. Nevertheless, Caesar's men were still struggling, attacked. Wow, that is already huge. You like already, uh, man, the enemy got too cocky right there. Was it Lebanese, whatever his name is. Man, like, come on now. Like, there's a time for celebration and cockiness, and not in the middle of a battle that you have yet to win. Oh, come on, dude. And he, that could have been that great there. It could have been the edge Caesar needs. I mean, they had to take their leader off. You know, and uh, just like you know, we've seen in past, you know, videos like the men leader, leaderless armies. If they don't have someone to kind of uh, get them going and get them excited and you know, whatnot, uh, it has the the opposite effect. Like, uh oh, you know, 
our leader is hurt now. Like, uh oh, what do we do? You know, so let's see how, uh, you know, Caesar, you know, obviously Caesar's already is in a bad situation right now. But, you know, Caesar, you know, he's got to know, like, use this for his advantage somehow. It fell on him. Nevertheless, Caesar's men were still struggling, attacked from all sides, and they could do little except protect themselves from the hail of missiles from the Numidian troops. It was a dire situation, and panic was spreading, and an Aquilifer even attempted to flee, forcing Caesar to grab him, turn him to face the enemy, and push him forward to the front. The day was coming to an end, and Caesar knew that he needed to reach his defences around Respina before nightfall, or else lose his army. He ordered every other cohort to turn around, his line now fighting on two fronts, and gave the order for them to throw a hail of peeler and charge in both directions. It is a testament to the training of Roman legions that such a maneuver could be organized and executed in the midst of battle. Wow. Taken by surprise by this sudden attack, the Numidian light infantry and cavalry pulled back to skirmish and avoid hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Caesar seized the opportunity and began withdrawing his forces from the battlefield as quickly as possible. Wow! As he did, Petraeus arrived with his reinforcements. With these fresh troops, the optimate force pursued uh -oh. Caesar's men, looking to re-engage. This time, Caesar took the initiative, ordering his men to turn and charge their pursuers. Petraeus was wounded in the skirmish, while the Numidians once again fell back, not wanting to be pinned in melee. This wow. time, Caesar continued to push them back over the high ground. Caesar paused his men here, wanting to see if the enemy would attack now that he had the terrain advantage. The Optimates were exhausted, had both commanders injured, and had inflicted as much damage as they could in a day. Wow. They each withdrew to their camp, Caesar's men also withdrawing to Ruspina. The casualties for both armies are not known, but given the encirclement of the Caesarian troops, it is likely they suffered more than the Optimates. Caesar had very nearly lost the entire campaign. If Labienus had not been wounded, he may have been able to better control the Optimate army and keep the pressure on Caesar, leaving no chance for him to escape. True. But Caesar was saved by his own strategic talent, his men's training, and luck with the wounding of both enemy commanders. Yeah. Nevertheless, Caesar had managed to avoid having his whole army destroyed, as had happened to Curio. He would be able to consolidate and seek a more favorable engagement later. Caesar's African War was not over yet, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see the next Wow. Wow. Man, Caesar, man. And I just, this episode in general just shows how much of an amazing, you know, general Caesar is. I mean, I, like, I don't even know, like, going into this, like, how does he come out on top? But he, every single time where I think, you know, I doubt him and think that, you know, is he's going to lose, even though I know he's not going to lose, but that you think that, man, he should be losing, he should lose. He doesn't. Somehow the tactics he uses turns it around and he comes out on top, like, you know, knowing when to, like, push forward and come back and surprising the enemy that way. And, hmm. Yeah, I mean, obviously it takes, you know, it takes some luck to be good, but man, those, those leaders getting hurt was big, 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 big. Cause obviously if they don't get hurt, it could be a different situation, but they did get hurt and he took advantage of that completely. So definitely another awesome, uh, awesome episode from uh, Kings and Generals on Caesar. And this one just came out today. So. I'm definitely interested to see what you guys think of this episode. I thought it was like genius, you know, by Caesar. Just the, everything he did, he did to a T. He did as much as he possibly could do to, you know, to give his army a chance to win. He did everything he possibly could do. And just to be in this situation where he did win, he had to, uh, like, like earlier in the episode, he had to give that speech. 
and had his, his men begging for forgiveness, basically. And uh, I, I'm not sure if those are the same men that were in this battle, but he his men fight for him like crazy. And they're, they're veterans. They know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly what to do, when to do it, when they get the uh, orders. So anyways, another great uh, episode. I appreciate you guys watching along with me. Hit that like and subscribe if you haven't yet, please. And uh, I'm sure you guys will let me know in the comments when another... Uh, video pops up here uh you know another uh caesar video pops up but until then we're gonna continue to throw some more uh you know definitely throw some more content out and eventually get that pull out eventually after i get you know you know after a little bit more time goes by and uh yes yeah, so i'll catch you guys in future videos thanks a lot you guys are awesome this, this uh episode was awesome uh this uh kings and generals channels is awesome and uh yeah i'll catch you guys in future videos peace